Action Station, 1370 WOCA. Sometimes the show starts before the show starts. And uh, I'm talking to John Fuller right now about what he does best. He answers questions about the law. And I was just picking his brain a little bit about something. The uh, phone lines are open, though, for you, the listener. This is a great opportunity for you to get some information about the law from John Fuller. The show is called Legally Yours, and John is an attorney at the law firm of Fuller and Fuller here in Ocala. And the only thing you need to know is the phone number right now. It's 622 622- Nine six two two six two two W O C A is the W O C A climate control source hotline. Six two two W O C A. Call at any time. We will stop what we're saying and go to you. We'll just you know give us a chance to catch our breath or whatever. Um, John, good morning. Good morning, Larry. It uh, is good to be here, and good morning to all our listeners. Uh, hope everybody is invo- enjoying this wonderful Florida sunshine. Uh, I think I've been soaked three times this morning already, <laughs> going and coming to yeah, places. Yeah. But anyway, it's good to be here. I'm glad that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, uh, have our listeners call in with questions if they have about a particular legal issue that may be affecting them, their family, or their friends. Uh, obviously, as we say frequently on this program, uh, if you if you have a case, you need to talk to a lawyer one-on-one. And at the Fuller and Fuller Law Firm, we practice trial law, personal injury, uh, business commercial law, uh, complex major family law matters, and social security disability. Uh, And we encourage folks to give us a call uh, at the office, and we'll be happy to talk with you about your individual case. If it's an area out of our area of practice, uh, we would be happy to uh, give you several names to refer to people who do specialize in a different area. Uh, having said that, uh, before the program, uh, we were talking a, a little bit about uh, judicial candidates. Mm-hmm. And I saw in the paper this morning that uh, the governor has, uh, or there, there has been a list of applicants, I think some 14, who have applied to be considered for appointment by the governor to fill the unexpired term of Judge Lambert, who was a circuit judge here and who was recently appointed to the Fifth District Court of Appeals, which is the appellate court that covers this area. So Judge Lambert has moved on to the appellate court. His judgeship uh, is open and uh, a governor will appoint someone, and then the next election cycle, uh, that person will have to stand for election, Mm -hmm. provided the election cycle doesn't come within, I think, one year or two years of appointment. Uh, So uh, that'll be interesting. That process is an appointive process. If there is an election for a county or circuit judgeship, then candidates qualify and run for that election somewhat like any other election with the exception that judicial races are nonpartisan. You cannot run uh, as a partisan candidate. You can't say I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican and you can't try to uh, imply or curry favor uh, with one political party or another or align yourself with that. You have to be totally neutral and run uh, without any political affiliation. It is a nonpartisan election. Uh, To qualify, uh, you have to be a member of the Florida Bar in good standing, which means you've had to uh, graduate from law school and pass the bar exam. Uh, You have to have practiced law five years, and you have to live in the circuit in which you're running for, if it's a circuit judgeship, or the county in which you're running for, if it's a county uh, judgeship. And it's an election just like any other election. Uh, It has some other anomalies. Uh, You have to run on your record. Uh, You cannot, there's a lot of rules, and I don't profess to know them off the top of my head. Uh, I'm sure anyone who is going to be a candidate for a judgeship uh, reads them carefully, and and I certainly would encourage (laughs) the scrupulous uh, uh, compliance with them uh, because they are sanctions if you violate it. Uh, But uh, you cannot, if you're a sitting judge running for re-election, you cannot personally solicit for funds 
from it, anyone. As voters, it's really one of the hard ones to pick. It is. And, and as a candidate, it's a very difficult thing to, to run for because – Political races are expensive. Yeah, uh, the yeah. filing fee alone is probably five or six thousand dollars. Wow! And so uh, you know you you have to raise campaign finances like any other candidate, but you can't go out and ask for it. Uh, you have uh, you cannot uh, comment on how you would pre-rule in a particular factual scenario if you're a candidate and someone says well if you have a case where xyz happened what's your ruling going to be they're not allowed to do that and they shouldn't do that and it's impossible to do that (laughs) because we've seen in the the two years we've been doing this show we have seen almost weekly how cases have shades of gray and different issues and competing uh things and the law is not always clear and and uh you don't know until you hear all the evidence and hear all the arguments uh, what you would do in a case, and so they can't announce that. They, you know, they can they can run on their experience. They can say, "I've practiced law X number of years, and I've had a varied experience. I've been, uh, I've had a private law firm. I know what it is to make a payroll and to have overhead." Uh, you know, that's always something that people talk about when we see people who are running for uh, a judgeship and they have always worked for government, either as a prosecutor or a defense lawyer. However, if, you're, if that's your background, you can say, by virtue of doing that, I have had uh, more trial experience because I've been in the courtroom every week. Mm-hmm. I have a docket of 150 cases, which most private lawyers don't. And therefore, I've tried twice as many jury trials as my opponent has or something wow, like wow. that. Uh, circuit judges hear cases of every, every area of the law, from family law to probate law to dependency law, juvenile law, criminal law, personal injury, negligence law, business commercial litigation law, uh, property law. Uh, all of those areas of the law can be tried before the judge. And one of the questions is, what is, you know, you can, you can talk about your experience level. Well, I've practiced law for X years, and I've tried cases in all these different areas of the law. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's sometimes one of the things. You can talk about your, your qualifications. Uh, I graduated, not me, but you could say, you know, I graduated number one in my class, uh, you know, or something like that. You cannot criticize your opponent. You cannot attack your opponent uh, in a judicial race. Uh, I ever, would you ever do that? Would you ever? No, I have no? no desire. I have great admiration for judges. Uh, my skill set to the extent that one would identify it as that, and I don't want to sound boastful, but it is being an advocate. Uh, uh, and judges, uh, you know, they're, 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 uh, they, they're to be there and weigh and decide. Uh, you know, it, it's not for everybody. It's, but, it's got to be tough. You got a home at the end of the day. You hope you made the right decision. Well, it, it is a very tough job, and, and uh, it... Uh, you know, you have to realize that in an adversary arena, which is what a trial or a hearing is, that in everything you do, you have a winner and you have a loser. I don't care how intellectually you analyze it. If you lose, you feel bad. I've done it 41 years. (laughs) <laughs> no lawyer wins every case. Right, right. Uh, cases are arguable. Uh, and then other things can happen. You can lose the case at the trial level, but turn around and win it at the appellate level. Uh, so, wow. you know, I mean, it's, wow. uh, you know, winning and losing is a funny thing. And it's important for judges and trial lawyers alike, uh, if they want to keep their health and their sanity, I think. Uh, to not uh, tie their personal worth, their personal self-image, necessarily to the outcome of a case. We have a one-minute break coming up, and then we'll be right back. If you have a question for John Fuller, this is a good time to call it in. The number again is 622-WOCA, 622-9622. We'll be back with Legally Yours with John Fuller right after this. The 
weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. Clouds and some sun today with a couple of showers and a heavy thunderstorm crossing the area. High 84 to 88. It'll be mostly cloudy tonight with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm around as well. Low 71 to 75. More clouds and sun tomorrow with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm. High 86 to 90. For Friday, more sunshine, but still a thunderstorm or two around in the afternoon. High 88 to 92. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Legally Yours, brought to you by Fuller & Fuller Attorneys at Law. On the air every Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m. with John Fuller, a board-certified civil trial lawyer for over 25 years. John welcomes your questions from business to complex family matters to legal disputes. So tune in every Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m. for Legally Yours with John Fuller, right here on WOCA 1370 a.m. and 96.3 FM, The Source. There you go. And John Fuller is here right now. By the way, I should have mentioned the date. It is Wednesday, July 16th. If you are listening on that same date, if, in other words, then you're listening to a live show. Uh, again, the phone number 622-9622. A legal question is uh, invited and welcome, and it can be about your own legal circumstances or somebody you know. Yes, uh, that, that would be, uh, we, we're always happy to uh, talk generally uh, with folks about the law. Uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about recently in any depth, and I think it, it may bear talking about, that's in the area of family law. Uh, that's, you know, we do not handle a volume family law practice, but we definitely handle the complex major involved family law case. And, and I always have two or three that I'm handling at any one time uh, because the complicated ones involve components of business law, commercial law, uh, real estate law, and a bunch of areas that I have litigated in. And then, of course, you have the emotional overlay and you have children's issues. Uh, but uh, if you are involved in or contemplating a complex major family law case where there's been a long-term marriage, there is a high income uh, producer in the family. They are family businesses involved. Oh, man. Uh, you have children issues involved. Uh, you know, those types of things, you need to seek legal counsel. And, and if you just like, you know, you need to seek marriage counseling to try to see if you can resolve the problems. But uh, there's a lot of things that, that, you know, it's better to go and know what your legal rights are, have a lawyer, and, and picking a lawyer in a family law scenario, I think is probably more delicate than in most uh, any case, because whether you're male or female, in, in almost every family law matter, there is a high level of emotionalism involved with it. And, and so sure there is. You, you want to have a lawyer who, who, who you can relate to and who you're comfortable with. Now, the lawyer needs to make it clear, and I always do, I'm not your counselor, I'm not your priest or your rabbi or somebody like that. I encourage you to go make those people a part of your team to give you the type of emotional support, spiritual support, uh, mental health support, help you analyze and cope with the issues that you have to deal with in order to regain your health and move on and live happily after the dust settles and the marriage is dissolved because you can't make two people stay together you can't make another party want to be married if that other party doesn't want to be married and so uh it's it, and it, it in complicated cases it involves a number of other allied professionals forensic certified public accountants uh vocational experts uh, business valuation experts and real estate appraisers, uh, antique appraisers, if, oh, if you wow. have a lot of antique or artwork, yeah. or that sort of thing. And it's, it, it is expensive. It's very expensive, but it's, it's much better to do it right and be prepared and less expensive in the long run than going in and uh, being behind the curve, yeah, so to speak, yeah, yeah. and trying to play catch up. But usually one party 
makes up his or her mind first. Somebody Somebody has decided that this marriage, for whatever reason, is not working, it's not satisfactory, and and I'm going to move on, uh, so to speak. And if, if, if you're confronted with that, either that's your position or if you are the other spouse who is the recipient of that. And I always encourage people, make every reasonable effort to try to reconcile your differences, to try to seek professional help with family counselors, marriage counselors, mm-hmm. whatever it takes, especially if it's a long-term marriage, especially if there are children involved. You know, really make the effort. But there comes a point where you can't make water run uphill. And you have a phone call coming in, so let's let's take the phone call. Good morning. Thank you for calling. You're on the air with John Fuller. Uh, Yes, good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. How are you? Very good, thank you. Uh, In order for law enforcement to uh, come into your home, they have to secure a search warrant. Uh, how is that obtained, and is that through? A, does that have to be through like a judge? Well, uh, first of all, in your premise, you are right. In, in order for law enforcement to enter your home, in most circumstances, they have to get a warrant, and I'll address that process in a minute. That is not true in absolutely every circumstance. There are uh, some circumstances where there are exceptions to that, but they're like when you're pursuing a fleeing felon, uh, you know, uh, you, you have reason to believe that, that evidence is being destroyed before you could get a search warrant. To get a search warrant, you have to, the law enforcement office. Uh, the law enforcement officers have to uh, have some evidence that is sufficient to establish what they call probable cause to believe that an offense has occurred and that there is material evidence in a certain dwelling. Uh, warehouse or or someplace where you have to get a search warrant, automobile, uh, on your cell phone. The Supreme Court just ruled in a very interesting case that cell phones now carry the same protection because they they have so much personal private information yeah, on right, it, right. Uh, about your life and about everything uh, that that a law enforcement officer who arrests you can't just look at your cell phone. Uh, he has to get a warrant. What they do is they prepare a probable cause affidavit in which the law enforcement officer who is investigating the case lists all of the factual evidence that he or she has gathered preliminarily that creates a probable cause to justify the the uh, uh, issuance of a search warrant and describes the location with specificity. It has to make sure that Uh it doesn't just say the apartment in apartment building A and there are 10 apartments in that apartment building. It has to be very specific. And uh, then they have to take that that affidavit uh, and, and take it to a judge. And we have on duty in Marion County and every county in Florida what is called what are called duty judges. And all the judges, county and circuit, rotate that obligation so that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's a duty judge who has the duty phone. And any law enforcement officer huh. at any time of the day or night, any day of the week, can call that duty judge, go to his home or her home, uh, go to the restaurant where they're eating dinner, go wherever. Oh, wow. uh, I've actually been at a at a dinner meeting. It was a bar function, and the duty judge was sitting at the group of lawyers and judges that were at the table where I was, and in walks uh, an investigator with a probable cause affidavit and the, the search warrant, and the judge took a minute, stopped, went outside, read, reviewed, whatever, signed the warrant. That is the check and balance and protection that we as citizens of this country enjoy under the Sixth Amendment uh, protection against unreasonable search and seizure. Do they ever not sign it? Uh, If they don't think that the affidavit has sufficient reliable evidence in which to issue it. I doubt that they refuse to sign it very often. Hmm. I've I've never been a prosecutor. 
Uh, I've never been a law enforcement officer, and I've never been a judge. So <laughs> the inner workings yeah, of yeah, that, yeah. I don't know. But for instance, um, one of the things that judges have to look at carefully is if the law enforcement are relying on the evidence that they are using to get the search warrant upon what a confidential source told them. Uh, uh, yeah. And then what is the reliability of that confidential source? Because they don't want to disclose that confidential source until they have to. Uh, uh, so, And usually confidential sources in criminal cases are people who themselves have already committed some type of criminal act, <laughs> and they have an arrangement right, with the right. prosecution or the law enforcement to provide substantial assistance, and it's fertile grounds for cross-examination. One of those guys take the stand. Uh, you had a vested interest in this. You were telling them what you wanted them to hear. You wanted to get the best deal you could for yeah, yourself. Right, right. You realized that the more you told them that they, you thought they wanted to hear, the better it was for you. Your credibility is not reliable because you were looking at it yourself, and you would have said the moon was made out of green cheese if you thought it would have got you out of jail. You're in a jail cell. You don't <laughs> like your jail cell. It's dark. It's dang. Right. You have no freedom. You know, that's the cross-examination. Yeah, yeah. yeah wow. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, the, the One of the things that, that came up it, it was this guy, and I told you before we went on the air, who was uh, using the standing ground law, and he had been a convicted felon. Yes. And, uh, and now it's up before the Florida Supreme Court, because apparently there were two cases, two different judges yes. made two different decisions. One said... Yes, you can use it. The other one said, "No, you can't." In two separate cases. Yeah. So now it's it's a, yes. We talked about that. That I I don't sit here and, and profess to know the answer. Those are two conflicting legal protections. The stand your ground law gives protection uh, to defend yourself without the duty to retreat. Okay, you have always had the duty to defend yourself. And if the ability to retreat was not there, you always had the ability to stand your ground. Everybody gets all exercised about that law. It didn't change that. Uh, you didn't have a duty to retreat if you were in your home and somebody broke into your home. But if you were out in public and you were being attacked before the stand your ground law, there was a, a, a basic case law, a body of case law that said you had to turn around and try to run mm. or, or get out of your way. Well, if you're 80 years old and you have an arthritic knee and, and somebody who's 20 years old and outweighs you by 50 pounds is coming yeah, after yeah. you with a, with a switchblade, uh, you know, how practical is it that you turn around and try to run? Uh, and I think that's what the legislature took into consideration when it was passing this law. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a right that you have under, under the Florida law. Then there is another law that says that it's a criminal violation for a convicted felon to possess a firearm. And then I didn't read the case you're talking about. You mentioned it before we went on the air. Yeah, yeah. But the scenario is you have a convicted felon who's not supposed to have a firearm. He illegally possesses the firearm, but he, for the sake of assumption and argument, is a victim of a violent crime that justified the use of lethal force to protect his body, and, and he stood his ground and used the illegal handgun to protect himself. What happens? Uh, obviously, you had two judges rule two separate ways, because this is a hard issue, yeah and, yeah, and and the law is difficult. And there's an old cliche in law school that that, uh, that hard cases make bad law because you've got two conflicting things. Yeah, right. I would suspect that they would be two separate cases, that he would be allowed to assert the stand-your-ground defense and would ask the court for an order in limine to prohibit any mention of his prior felony conviction and the possession, illegal possession of the firearm as either not being relevant and material, or if it were relevant and material, the relevancy would be outweighed. Any probity value that would have, which seems to would be limited, would be outweighed by the inflammatory effect it would have on the jury and not handle it, wow. and then try the other case 
uh, separate. Wow. John, we've got, we've got 10 seconds. What's your phone number? Uh, the office number is 352-547-4292. Our toll-free is 855-534-2565. Thank you, John. Uh, call us if you need those numbers repeated. This is WOCA Ocala. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall. The acting head of the VA makes his first appearance before Congress since taking over. Sloan Gibson has already told the president that his look inside the VA system has shown, quote, systematic problems and cultural issues, and, ha and those have been preventing veterans from getting timely care. Fox's Molly Henn.